Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today's webinar. This is Minji Kim, Program Specialist at the International Information and Working Center for Intangible Cultural Heritage in the Asia Pacific region under the auspices of UNESCO, ICAP. Working within the framework of the 2000 Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage, ICAP operates information and networking programs for the 48 member states of the Asia Pacific region. In line of the, those mandates, its CAP and the UNESCO API office are co-hosting the webinar series on maritime ICH. This webinar is part of the expert meeting for building networks on maritime ICH, which has been organized by its CAP since 2018. Due to COVID-19, we hold the meeting as a webinar this year so that we can reach to more people in this pandemic era. The theme of the webinar is Maritime Living Heritage, Building Sustainable Livelihood and Ecosystems in the Asia Pacific Region. For two days, we have invited 10 presenters from 10 different countries in the region. They are experts, professors, practitioners, government officers, and NGOs. I hope you enjoy the various voices from the safeguarding ICH from different stakeholders. The webinar will continue until tomorrow, and you can find the detailed information about the presenters and uh, at the HCAP's official webpage in the ICH webinar series menu. You may download all the papers there. Before we start with their presentations, we, I would like to welcome Ms. Nisha, Director of UNESCO APIA Office, to deliver her welcoming remarks. Ms. Nisha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Min. Mr. Gu Hyung Kyung, Director General of HCA, Winmo Park, Director Ichka and Ichkap team, Boram and Minji. Also Dr. Athena Trakadas, co-chair of the Heritage Network of for the UN Decade for Ocean Sciences, who will deliver pre-recorded message today and participants from across Asia and the Pacific. My colleague, Ellen. Greetings to all from the Blue Pacific. I think the topic that we are going to discuss today is probably um, closest to the hearts of the island nations that my office covers. And it is our privilege to co-organize this event in partnership with HCAP. Thank you very much for this collaboration. I cannot speak much about the issues around intangible cultural heritage. I can only say that there are elements of our life or there are elements of society or social life which for a long time were ignored in development deliberations, in different development planning. And it is rather recent that their importance is being recognized as an important not component, but as an important framework for development. And I'm mentioning this because we are having this webinar as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. Each one of us are caught in our own little islands, in our own homes, in our own boundaries, within our own four walls. And we have seen how intangible cultural heritage 
has supported people's ability to cope with this tragic situation, to reach out to one another, to support one another. And at the same time, revived a discussion around two key aspects of development. One is sustainable development, how much of and what kind of economic growth we want. And the second is related to inclusion. What kind of societies we want to be and what kind of economies we want to grow and for who. An intangible cultural heritage in these deliberations is important because it plays a critical role in social, cultural, and as well as uh, biodiversity in the Pacific, of course, coastal and marine resources, which are part of people's lives, everyday lives. Second, it's an important aspect of economy. Nobody recognized the importance of what we call the subsidiary economy or secondary economy or the handicraft or the cottage industries as it is being done now. And these are the economic faces of intangible cultural heritage. And third aspect, which is being recognized is of peace and security, because most often peace and security issues are related to people's sense of identity, their culture, their tradition, People fight over these things, forgetting economy, forgetting their health. So intangible cultural heritage, when we look at it from a development perspective and not just the um, safeguarding for the sake of safeguarding, rather literally taking it as the living heritage. And we place this in the area domain that HCAP covers which is to do with information technologies, ICTs. And we open a realm which is highly relevant for this context, but at the same time is also highly relevant for a discussion around issues of legitimacy, who owns the digitalized knowledge, about its usage, to what purposes it can be put used to. And these two issues often raise another complicated dimension which we are seeing, and this is of trust. The digital content, who can access it, how the owners retain the knowledge and retain the ownership of the knowledge as well as remain responsible for the knowledge to be, the symbols to be living, continue to grow and not get fossilized in the digital or virtual world. So these are some of the considerations I think which we need to be taken into account when we are talking about intangible cultural heritage and the digital transformations that are taking place in relation to development. And let me leave you and welcome you again with these thoughts and I wish you a very good meeting. Thank you very much for having us and we look forward to continued collaboration. Over to you. for your warm welcoming remarks. Now I would like to introduce Mr. Kim ki the Director General of HCAP for his welcoming remarks. Thank you very much, Minji. Hello, everyone. It's very nice to see you. My name is Kim from, from HCAP. Uh, today, I'm very happy to see all of you uh, for this kind of the very meaningful maritime ICH conference. Uh, 
Uh, actually, the, you know that now we are facing many challenges because of pandemic, but anyway, we overcome this kind of the threat. So we are very happy to be here through the kind of virtual space. Uh, thank you, Nisha, first time to see you. And then welcome to the RP office. And then my warm welcoming to the keynote speaker, Dr. Athena Trakata. And today's third person, uh, Professor Yu Incheol. 안녕하세요. Uh, and then I know that there, there is a Professor Narumun from Thailand, Kopunka. And also my the Philippine colleagues. I'm not sure it's the right pronunciation or not. Anyway, uh, Magandang Ubagi. Is it right? <laughs> Uh, and also the Minglava uh, is the only the, uh, the Myanmar word I can speak. Minglava. And also the welcome, welcome, uh, Bentao, or I spent three years in Vietnam, so I know already, already a little bit about the Vietnamese. So very happy. To see you and then uh, say hello uh, by the Vietnamese word. And then lastly, is, is also the, the, the getting popular in Korea. Namaste, uh, Professor Roma Mudra. We say that we say hello nearly six or seven different languages. But anyway, even though we are using very different words and a different cultural background, but we meet today to share our information, our knowledge, and then to find the good solution, how we can contribute for the climate changing in part of the, some maritime heritage. Uh, recently, ISCAP held the first World Forum for Intangible Cultural Heritage. And, and uh, it's really amazing because the, the World Forum was combining kind of the on and off technology. It's like, like the hybriding the on-site stage and then virtual space. And then can you guess how many uh, attendants are joining the forum? Accumulatedly, it's uh, nearly 100,000. Very big number, right? Very big number. Compared to the previous one, last year also we organized that kind of the world forum. And then the keynote speaker of the last year is very well known, the eighth UN Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki Moon. But the attendance number is probably around 500. Even though there is a big guy, is a keynote speaker, only the couple of hundred number is large. But now we can disseminate and then share our ideas and our information very easily and very convenient because we find the solution. How can we, uh, like, uh, we can uh, over, uh, 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 come, over, come over any kind of threat? So uh, even though we are only around the 10 people, Today, we are gathered. But because we are using the ICT technology, so I'm quite sure our messages can overcome any kind of the, some um, kind of barriers, time zone, or some space. So, pandemic actually gives us a new opportunity. So. Uh, please, we take advantage about uh, this kind of opportunity to share information more easily and to access the people uh, more, com more conveniently. Uh, as, as, as Nina uh, say, actually the maritime intangible cultural heritage is uh, 
cultural heritage created in the human interaction with the sea with a wide range of cultural resources. However, with a growing awareness of climate change and then rapid urbanization, maritime heritage safeguarding is getting more critical. So I think now is the time to go beyond the only studying the heritage itself into safeguarding efforts for the community's sustainability. This year is very special because we are now heading into the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. Except this webinar is a third time. Two years ago, this, uh, this webinar held in Seoul and last year in Huyang, Vietnam. And then this time, we are meeting through the virtual space. But even though we did not met face to face, but we have more chance. Share and then access very easily. Please, we enjoy this kind of a challenge and then we find the solution. As human beings always find a way when we face some challenges. Thank you very much. And then See you again. Uh, if there is chance, I will go there and then you will come here. Thank you. Thank you, Director Kim, for your remarks. Uh, from next year, the UN Decades of Ocean Science will begin. To commemorate this, Ms. Athena Tratakas, co chair of the Ocean Decade Heritage Network, will be joining us today to deliver her speech. I would like to thank the organizers of this webinar meeting, the International Information and Networking Center for Intangible Cultural Heritage in the Asia Pacific region, Director General Keum, and the UNESCO APIA office for their kind invitation to deliver a keynote for the meeting, Maritime Living Heritage, Building Sustainable Livelihood and Ecosystems in the Asia Pacific Region. My name is Athena Trakatis, and I'm a maritime archeologist at the National Museum of Denmark. And I'm co-chair along with Anthony Firth of the Ocean Decade Heritage Network. As a maritime archeologist, I focus on the past exploitation of marine resources uh, but this means I also spend a lot of time documenting modern fishing communities, especially in North Africa, where this picture was taken. Uh, and that is um, my, my area of study for intangible cultural heritage in the maritime community. This present ICH meeting, of course, is part of the expert meeting for building a network on maritime ICH with the overall aim of sharing information and raising awareness for safeguarding ICH to various stakeholders. And specifically within the concept note of today's meeting, there are three objectives. Uh, to improve our awareness of the relation between maritime ICH and the pillars of sustainable development, namely environmental sustainability, inclusive social development and economic development, explore maritime ICH transmission and safeguarding activities for environmental sustainability and resilience, and establish a network of diverse stakeholders for the safeguarding of maritime ICH in the Asia Pacific region. Today, I would like to address the third objective in more detail by focusing on the efforts to establish networks at a global and at regional level for safeguarding maritime cultural heritage as a key to reach a sustainable future. I would like to do this by discussing the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development 2021-2030 and the role of the Ocean Decade Heritage Network for serving as a potential link between the Ocean Decade's initiatives and maritime living heritage stakeholders. I believe that we are all familiar at this point with the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its 17 SDGs. 
or Sustainable Development Goals. Part of the measurable steps towards reaching SDG 14, Life Below Water, depends on monitoring the ocean state, so physical, biogeochemical, ecosystems, and the human impact on the ocean. The Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development 2021-2030, I'll call it the decade for short, is a UN initiative housed within UNESCO and the IOC, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, and it's very much linked to supporting the efforts of reaching SDG 14 targets. However, its outcomes also touch upon at least 10 other SDGs. The Decade Initiative promotes a common framework for supporting stakeholders in studying and assessing the health of the world's oceans. The Decade also provides the framework for leveraging further investment in ocean research, as well as serves as a platform for building transformative partnerships and collaboration in a multi-stakeholder context. The framework is focused on seven outcomes, which I will return to later, but are here highlighted on the left. The Decade Initiative uh, is in its preparatory phase from 2018 to 2020. And I've put up a timeline here to show you what's happened or what will be happening in the near future. So there's been uh, announcements for the decade, preliminary uh, decade roadmap workshops, global planning meetings held in Copenhagen. The one in March 2020 in Paris was held virtually. And the UN Oceans Conference, of course, was supposed to be held in Lisbon in June, but has now been delayed. However, progress has uh, continued and there has been the recent publication of the implementation plan in August of 2020 and just recently the call for decade actions. There will be a regional launch in Egypt and then the main launch of the decade will be in Berlin starting in 2021 of course the implementation phase of the decade. But what about maritime cultural heritage in the decade? In the call for action, Our Ocean, Our Future, launched the first UN Ocean Conference in 2017, member states recognize that the ocean forms an important part of our natural and cultural heritage and called on stakeholders to develop comprehensive strategies to raise awareness of the natural and cultural significance of the ocean. The draft roadmap of the decade, published in 2018, states that ocean science should be interpreted broadly as encompassing social sciences and the human dimension. The importance of cultural heritage has now been clarified during the preparatory phase of the decade with the implementation plan in the second version just published in August 2020, highlighting that ocean science is broad. It encompasses natural and social science disciplines, local and indigenous knowledge. The decade will create a paradigm shift in the generation of qualitative and quantitative ocean knowledge, including from currently data poor regions, such as the deep ocean, and coastal areas where much of the human interaction with ocean is concentrated. The first global planning meeting of the decade was hosted by the National Museum of Denmark in Copenhagen in May of 2019. And the purpose of the National Museum in holding the meeting was to ensure that cultural heritage would be considered. The Ocean Decade Heritage Network, ODHN, was formed at this meeting by a group of 11 maritime cultural heritage specialists in attendance, which now form the Provisional Organizing Committee of ODHN. And this is some of us, of course, at the meeting, not all. Um, ODN is now recognized as an official partner of the UNESCO IOC decade. ODHN is a global network that represents a key stakeholder group of the decade, cultural heritage specialists, marine archaeologists, heritage managers, ethnographers, ocean literacy specialists who work in marine, underwater, and coastal environments and with coastal communities. And we come from governmental, intergovernmental, academic, and NGO backgrounds. 
Broadly, we are in part those who study, work with, and represent the social sciences and human dimension referred to in the decade, about 200 members globally. Our purpose is twofold, to raise awareness in the cultural heritage community about the decade and to coordinate a targeted global response to improve the integration of cultural heritage within the marine sciences during the decade's phases, and two, to have the essential role of culture acknowledged in delivering sustainable development in our seas and our oceans, especially in line with the SDGs. By becoming a partner of the decade in May of 2019, we have been able to provide feedback on working documents from meetings and most importantly, the working drafts of the implementation plan now being presented for ratification at the United Nations General Assembly this autumn. We are happy that suggested inclusion for cultural heritage has been considered and accepted and working texts have been amended providing clarifications about what ocean science contains, including natural and social sciences, local and indigenous knowledge. And our suggestions for the implementation plan have in large part been accepted. There seems to be a place for maritime cultural heritage in the decade. But how can uh, we safeguard maritime cultural heritage as a key to reach a sustainable future within the decades framework? If we take a look at the decade action framework, first focusing on the decade outcomes. I mentioned earlier here. And there's seven outcomes, originally six, but now seven outcomes. An inspiring, engaging ocean was just added this summer. And MCH is key in all of these. If we look at a clean ocean, cultural heritage can contribute to a clean ocean by enabling better understanding of the extent and risks of legacy pollution from shipwrecks, mining waste, and land-based sources. A clean ocean is also important for the long-term preservation of MCH. A healthy and resilient ocean, cultural heritage is fundamental to understanding how many coastal and marine ecosystems achieve their present form and to understanding the pressures upon them. Cultural heritage can be an important component of marine ecosystems. A predicted ocean, understanding ocean past. Human interaction with the historic environment is essential to understanding our ocean present and to forecasting change and its implications for human well being and livelihood. For a safe ocean, cultural heritage informs the understanding of coastal inhabitation and intervention in the past and present, including the impact of previous catastrophes. To identify risks, present examples of human adaptions, and to encourage resilience. A sustainably harvested and productive ocean, cultural heritage is a major contributor to the blue economy, especially through recreation and tourism. Increasing productivity should enhance and not damage irreplaceable cultural heritage. A transparent and accessible ocean, information about cultural heritage is also essential to understanding the past present and future of humanity's relationship with the seas and oceans. An inspiring and engaging ocean. Information about cultural heritage is fascinating to the public and it does enable engagement with many topics in ocean literacy. But how can we safeguard maritime cultural heritage as a key to reach a sustainable future within the decades framework? And how can networks such as ODHN assist in this? So let's look again at the Decade Action Framework. First, we looked at the Decade Outcomes, but now let's look at the Decade Actions, the first step in the process. As we move forward to the beginning of the implementation phase of the decade, the just released call for action plans highlights the importance of networks in addressing the decade's challenges and ultimately helping meet the outcomes, those seven outcomes that I discussed. The stakeholder engagement platforms highlighted here, looking at regional, sectoral, or thematic levels, specifically name possibilities for cultural heritage. And this is because of the lobbying that's been done 
by various stakeholders over the course of the last year that this is now included. The third objective for this present meeting, webinar meeting, is to establish a network of diverse stakeholders for the safeguarding of maritime tangible cultural heritage in the Asia Pacific region. This might be a way forward for joining in the decades initiatives. This is where we are heading with ODHN and as a thematic platform and alliance with UNESCO. And we are building alliances with other not-for-profits that focus on ocean science and with maritime cultural heritage. I would like to remind you of the ODHN platform, and I would suggest looking at our website for some of the networks we work with that might be of interest for MCH initiatives globally and regionally. And I can think of some very good parallels, particularly in East Africa with the Rising from the Depths Network. You can find these links and resources on our website, and we really want to serve as a clearinghouse for information for like-minded uh, networks and interest groups. The aim with such networks is to have the power of cultural heritage acknowledged as a medium for engaging the public in addressing the sustainability of our coasts and our oceans, to investigate, protect, and celebrate long-standing relationships between people and the sea. Ultimately, the decade is a vital opportunity to improve focus on the ocean's cultural heritage, including intangible, indigenous, and traditional culture that can be safeguarded for a sustainable future in the face of modernization and climate change. We would like to suggest working together. There is a place for maritime cultural heritage at the table in the decade, and it will be in many forms. Thank you very much for your attention and have a good meeting. Ms. Athena Trakatas for the wonderful presentation on the decade of ocean science. Now I would like to move on to today's session. The theme of the first session is traditional maritime skills and knowledge for inclusive social and economic development. Professor Tan in Yu from Jeju National University of Korea will serve as the moderator today. Before we get started, I would like to have a little announcements. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box in your YouTube control panel. We, we will also have time for questions at the end. Also, you may download all the papers from HCAP's official website under the ICH webinar series menu. Now, I would like to, uh, without further ado, please welcome today's moderator, Professor Yu. Professor, floor is yours. Uh, I cannot hear you, uh, Professor Yu. Uh, thank you, Minji, and thank you for inviting me to today's online meeting. And I'm very pleased to discuss on the topic on Maritime ICH with the distinguished uh, uh, presenters from Asian countries. Now, uh, we are already behind the schedule. So please keep the, your time for 15 minutes presentation. And I would like to invite the uh, first speaker uh, from Thailand, uh, Dr. Aruno Thai. He will uh, talk about sea people of Thailand called Chao Lei. So please welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, Let me share my screen. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank you, um, ICH CAP, for this opportunity to join the uh, webinar. And hello, colleagues. Um, 
The case that I will be presenting today about um, ICH and inclusive community is about the uh, sea people in Thailand. So in Thailand, we call these people Chao Le, uh, which means sea people, or formerly we knew them as sea nomads, but now uh, they didn't have a chance to travel extensively as before. Um, let me show you in the map in Southern Thailand, uh, Southwestern Thailand, where uh, we have this um, uh, arrow pointing to, uh, is the home uh, to the sea nomads for several centuries. And we can see the photo of them being on boat, of uh, having temporary shelters on shore, and more and more settled, um, like having a wooden house, um, larger and larger communities. So in Thailand, um, with the Chao Le, we have the population of about uh, 12,000, a total of 45 villages. Um, and uh, they are uh, only in southern part of Thailand because we have a coastal area. These people are indigenous groups. Um, they used to roam, uh, some groups used to live on boats and travel uh, around in their small boats. Sometimes they make temporary settlement on islands and along coastal areas, especially during monsoon season when the sea is too rough to travel, uh, when there are a lot of storms. But um, as I mentioned, and I, I think as the, the keynote speech, that uh, nowadays um, uh, the development and also uh, tourism policy also affects the life of these indigenous populations. So now all groups in Thailand are sedentary. But um, luckily, at present, the marine and maritime knowledge and skills remain significant in some communities. Uh, so in spite of modernity, um, they are able to maintain uh, some of their knowledge and skills. Uh, the skills are sometimes uh, mentioned as reading the water to remember the wind and reading the sky to remember the star. And I'd like to make uh, some specific co focuses on some of the um, ICH uh, of these people. Uh, the main one is boat. So without boats, they couldn't be sea people. So the three groups have their own traditional, unique forms of boats. Um, I'd like to mention the, the first one, the top one is Kabang, the Morgan boat, um, that sometimes uh, were their home uh, during the dry season. And the bottom one, the Prahu of the Urakla Voy, we can call this as the art and heart of marine livelihood. And after tsunami, um, our team got the funding from um, UNESCO and UNDP to document uh, some of the uh, boat building craft and some of the uh, social implications of this. So for these boats, they are vehicles and homes that form floating community in the old days, especially for the Morgan, the most uh, nomadic of all three groups. Um, in the old days, uh, they were human and wind powered boats. So you can imagine sustainable and self-sufficient uh, uh, matter that these boat brings to the community. The boats allow access to resources in a sustainable manner in that their mobility being sea nomads make the national resource appropriation spread in wider areas. So they're not concentrated in one area. Uh, the environment, the ecology, uh, is not degraded because of this mobility. So their mobility is also linked uh, with sustainable use of resource. Um, the other factor is that frequent travels and visits help them to maintain strong ties with their groups. So their groups are actually large, but the, the settlement or the uh, floating communities are quite small because they have to travel a lot. They are able to maintain the ties with the, their boats so actually the sea is not the obstacle. The sea is the route uh, to different resources, to different uh, places and communities for them to visit. And I'd like to mention that the Morgan Kabang, their traditional boat has been declared Thailand National Intangible Cultural Heritage by Thailand Ministry of Culture in 2018. Um, Prahu and Kabang traditional boats also um, facilitate access to places. And I'd like to mention the issue uh, that is tied with um, ICH 
in that marine knowledge and skills are also reflected in place names in the Chao Lei language. And now it's, um, it's a concern that most of the names have been forgotten or have been replaced um, by Thai names. So these names, they are representation of collective memories of landscape and seascape. And they further reaffirm the long history and close connection between themselves um, as, as their social beings and the sea. Um, another issue is that by being maritime and marine uh, population, they have interesting rituals and ceremonies that the whole community helps in preparing and organizing. Uh, friends and relatives from other communities also join in. So sometimes they switch the day in order to allow other from the other communities to join in. So it's a large celebration like you uh, saw in the photos. Um, the ceremonies and the rituals also signify the change of the monsoon season. So the, um, the ceremonies are usually organized in April, May or in October where there's a change uh, or transition of the season, which also signifies um, that uh, they are really sea people who move the movement along the sea and uh, coastal areas also dictated by this rhythm, natural rhythm of the sea. Um, these ceremonies and rituals affirm their maritime and marine knowledge because even young generations participate in this ceremony and learn about symbolic meanings of boat building, of seasons, of the, uh, the uh, knowledge that has passed through generations. And it also creates the sense of community, social bond, collectivity, and inclusivity. Another interesting uh, issue following from having the boats, traditional boats, is that the boats have been downscale, meaning that the, the male members of the community can make miniature boats that are really detailed uh, down to scale of the big boats. And uh, this has been made firstly into toys uh, for children to learn about boats. Um, but large boats um, like the Prahu and Gabang uh, is now a dying art of making the real traditional boats because large trees are hard to find. And the trees are mostly found in the national park, reserve forests, or private property where it's uh, difficult to access. Some men, especially the, el the elderly, uh, still have the vivid memory of boat crafting, so they can make miniature boats um, for uh, to being toys for the children. And they have the potential of bringing income from tourism, being tourism uh, souvenirs. But unluckily, it, they are not being promoted as tourist souvenirs because they are exclusively sold in the communities. So the sales are quite limited. Another issue is uh, the knowledge uh, of marine areas and coastal areas also affirm food security and social connectivity and collectivity. Um, I won't mention uh, the general knowledge of uh, the entire population, but I'd like to focus on the knowledge on fallback resources, meaning that the resources that are there and easily accessible by women, by children, by elderly, and sometimes by the disabled in the community. And these enable uh, these people to simply walk off to the beach and strand area to find shellfish, crabs, sea urchin and other marine food uh, to sustain their living. And sometimes they sell these uh, fish and sell fish as a mean to uh, extra income. So not only food security, but some of the in extra income uh, for the family. And the roles of marine knowledge and skills also affirm uh, this food security and social connectivity in that uh, the principle of food sharing is really significant in the three groups um, of sea people. It's practically part of everyday lives. So they have strong uh, social and emotional ties to their community. And we can observe that even those who intermarry, who marry uh, from outside communities usually remain within the communities. And it's the outsiders who usually move in the community. There's also an um, issue uh, with this uh, practice, but um, we won't have time to, to mention or elaborate on this. 
I'd like to say that with food sharing, the principle of food sharing um, uh, in the crisis of COVID-19 became the inspiration for all. And it has been covered by the newspaper and news source in Thailand. In that Chow Lake community, they uh, have a lot of fish and they dry this extra fish. They have the exchange scheme with the Korean community, another group of indigenous people, especially in mountainous um, area uh, that uh, have um, rotational farming, growing rice. So the Korean communities have extra rice. The Chow Le community, the sea people communities have extra fish and dry fish. So they exchange, you know, amidst of this uh, difficulty of being locked down, being difficult to earn um, monetary income. So this is an extension of community food security into exchange between Korean communities and Chow Le community. So we observed that often neglected knowledge and skills became the inspiration or hope for urban populations. Because in urban uh, settings, when locked down, meaning that we need to go to supermarket or we need to stock up our food, you know, it's uh, really difficult to exchange. We need money. Um, to buy food uh, in order to survive during lockdown. Um, like I mentioned, modernization and modernity uh, saw these um, skills and knowledge dwindling. So there's attempt in revitalizing ICH. Um, like I mentioned, after tsunami, uh, we got generous funding from UNESCO and other um, uh, donors to do uh, the trails to document some of the knowledge and skills. Uh, these tra trails are interesting in that it, um, the traditional trails of the Morgan to walk to get the, uh, their food and um, medicine in the forest. So they're not only good in the coastal areas and in the sea. They're good in the forest, beach forest, mangrove forest, or island forest as well. So we made this into a trail there visitors and outsiders could learn about their ethnobotany and learn about their knowledge and skills that are dying. And in some schools, especially Godly Bay School in Stone Province, um, we have indigenous teacher who's really keen on safeguarding these um, uh, knowledge. And she had one classroom and you can see the mural of the class depicting the original history of the, the sea people roaming around. So we have knowledge um, class uh, provided uh, in school uh, by progressive uh, teachers like this. And these pictures are the additional uh, knowledge camp that our team provided for the school. Uh, it's very easy to have uh, this kind of camp you know, when we have uh, dedicated teachers and uh, interested children eager to learn about maritime and marine livelihood, although they their life nowadays um, are quite limited in terms of earning income and going out to sea, but at least you know they can learn and maintain the pride and identity of the knowledge. So this is my last slide, and I'd like to sum up uh, that the, the title of my presentation, The Ties and Types of Knowledge, um, signify that maritime and marine knowledge are sources of connectivity, collectivity, inclusiveness, and community cohesion. And it can be extended beyond the communities itself. Um, although the knowledge and skills of the Chow Le, the Sea people are like tides, that's the uh, analogy to tides that can ebb you know, and come up again. Um, the tides of knowledge can be vital revitalized if natural resources are recuperated and regenerated and importantly, if market economy and modernity and also conservation policy are adjusted for the benefits of traditional communities. So that's all my, for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Arunutai. And the uh, next speaker is Professor Pelayo at the University of Santo Tomas from the Philippines. She will talk about uh, women empowerment. Please welcome her. Um, thank you, Professor Yu. I'll be sharing my... Uh... Okay. Okay. 
Okay, I would like to thank uh, ICHCAP and UNESCO APIA for office for this very interesting activity on the webinar on maritime living heritage. I would like to welcome the online audience in this presentation entitled Strengthening Women Fisher Folk Empowerment Towards Social Inclusion in Coastal Environment of Malolos, Bulacan, Philippines. Women in the Philippine fisheries are often labeled as the invisible fisher folk. Their pre-harvesting contributions are multifaceted, involving bait gathering, net fixing, and meal preparations for their husband, while post-harvesting activities include bringing the fish to the shore, sorting, and cleaning of the daily catch. Women are normally associated with household chores. They are rarely admitted as an essential factor in pursuing their livelihood in the coastal communities. In most cases, Women's participation in fishing communities is neither socially recognized or economically compensated. The primary goal for the development of women in the fisheries is to empower them, make them productive and self-sufficient. In this way, they can have an equal status as partners in promoting the living conditions of their own families and communities. For the literature review, empowerment is all about people taking control of their lives, setting their own agenda, gaining skills, building self-confidence, solving problems, and developing self-reliance. The study acknowledges the importance of empowering women fisher folk to carry on with their role in enhancing food security. Social inclusion is an undertaking of enhancing the participation in society, specifically to those who are less advantaged, through building opportunities, chance to use resources, having means to be heard and respect to everyone's rights, giving women a chance to be heard in the coastal communities and considering their welfare in policy making and project formulations will help them surpass all the challenges that may come their way and will promote their inclusion in the fishing industry. The purpose of the study is to describe the overall portrait of the women fisher folk based on their profile, characters, experiences, activities, and values. This study also explores different challenges in strengthening women empowerment that affect social inclusion in the coastal environment. The research design is an ethnographic study of women fisher folk as they go through their activities and their lives in the fisheries. It is a qualitative design where values, behaviors, belief, language, and learned patterns are being recounted and explicated. For the methodology, triangulation through participant observation, one-on-one -on -one interviews, and focus group discussion are employed as ethnographic methods in the study. Participant observation is utilized to observe their fishing community, their fishing-related activities, their verbal and nonverbal communications, and their community as a whole. Face-to-face -face interview involved 33 women fisher folks who are 18 years old and above, actively engaged in fishing-related activities for not less than three years, and has been living in one of the coastal communities for not less than five years. Focus group discussion focused on the experiences of eight women fisher folk chosen based on the scores of the empowerment evaluation. The study site. The study was conducted in the five coastal barangays in the city of Malolos, Bulacan, namely Babatnin, Kaliligawan, Masile, Namayan, and Pamarawan, respectively. The portrait of the experiences of women fisher folk, their characters, activities, beliefs, and values. Caregiver, namamailis daan or aquaculture worker. They work as caretakers or operators of palais daan or fish ponds owned or tenanted by landlords. They are normally called as bantay who are in charge of setting, feeding, monitoring, and guarding the ponds in two, three to four cycles a year. They are also in charge in pond preparations like in cleaning, draining, drying, and filling of water. They take part in simple bookkeeping and in providing cooked food during the long hours of harvesting. Risk taker. Nagugulaman or seaweeds gatherers. They provide a jelly-like substance extracted from red algae, known as the gulaman dagat, a cooking substitute for gelatin, a clarifying agent for soda drinks, and an agent mix for making pails. The risk-taking activity starts at around 5 in the morning as they paddle their way to the sea using a canoe type of boat, then could, would carefully gather the seaweeds by scooping them inside the boat 
using their bare hands or bamboo sticks. Collected seaweeds will be hanged in clotheslines for faster drying. Then it will be brought to the local market or to the plastic traders at 25 pesos per kilo. They usually collect 10 to 20 kilos for the span of 15 days. The most difficult part is the fact that they cannot afford to buy their own banca, that they have to pay a rent of 30 pesos per day in order for them to proceed with the day's work. The mana na laba or the oyster pickers. Women engaged in talaba or oyster speaking begin their work at 12 noon. They would paddle their way to the stakes for about 30 minutes, usually all alone by themselves. When they arrive at the area, they will submerge to waste high water after leaving their boats at a secured place, carrying with them a hammer, a personally crafted belt bag, and a screwdriver, they will proceed to collect their day's produce. After gathering, they will return to their homes to clean and shock the talaba. The danger of the manalaba includes the threat of drowning during the times when the waters are very high. The namamaklad or the actual fisher folks. Namamaklad is when women go out regularly on bankas, taking the risk with their husbands to fish. Their activity starts at as early as 10 in the evening. They would sail to the open sea toward their fish corals, exposing themselves to unstable weather conditions with only the stars and the moon as their working companions. The strong winds that cause the rough seas during the habagat season make fishing a life-threatening activity. The namamaklad is supposed to have a strong body and patience in order to withstand the tedious requirement of sorting the catch for the night. There are no restrictions for this activity since they still practice even during the eighth month of their pregnancy and would usually resume on the fourth month after giving birth. It is not unusual to see them tugging along with them, their newly born, just to give them the needed care and sustenance. The Influencer Bacolera or fish wholesalers. Bacolera is a term used to call a female fish trader who independently positions and serves at the forefront of the fish trading business. The Bacolera is often considered as a big time trader in the island who has the capacity to earn as much as 10,000 to 20,000 worth of gross income as the trading day closes. The Bacolera's day starts at 3 a.m. by heading towards the main ports to check the availability of the possible trading goods. Their bankas are loaded with banyeras or pails of distinct color and emblem exclusive to them. They are responsible for negotiating the prices of their catch to the consignation or the big time middleman. They influence the prices of their fish commodities since they take hold the biggest supply of sea products that will be distributed to the different marketplaces to the numerous fish vendors. Strategies, Tindera or the fish vendors, or the Tindera is a peddler who sells fish either to their own community or in the far barangays. Their activity starts at around 3 a.m., waiting normally in the ports for the motorboats to arrive. With their pails and bamboo or plastic baskets, they would try to secure their daily ranging from 5 to 20 kilos. They would then hurriedly go aboard the banca to proceed to the town or the barangay main roads. As they arrive at their designated areas, they would get to their pedicab or a bicycle with an attached side carriage, arrange all their fishes, and start the regular route of seven kilometers long. They would usually scream their common chant to inform their suki that they're already in the area. They make use of the cell phones in order for their buyers to place orders ahead of time, informing them of the available products. They provide special services such as cleaning the fishes and errands, bringing vegetables for them. The preservers, the mag aasin or the salt makers. Salt farming is making a living through the salt salt production. The task of the salt makers starts from the preparation of the salt beds, condenser pans, brine pop setup, brine water passage, and they would then proceed their actual salt melting process and finally harvesting. They have to wait for the sun heated hours of the day to harvest. The magbabagoong or the shrimp paste makers. Bagoong or shrimp paste is a common ingredient in most foods, which is made from alamang or the fermented krill. The magbabagoong day starts with pamamakyaw or wholesale buying of the krill at 4 to 5 a.m. 
small timers buy five pairs of kilos of krill, then they would proceed to the houses to watch the krill and put seven kilos of salt per pail to ferment them for one week inside the big tapayan or the big old clay jar. Then they were, are responsible enough to make sure that their hands are clean as they mix the solution using their bare hands, avoiding spoilage of the fermented krill. The magtutuyo or the salted fish makers. Since fish is highly perishable, they are offered in its process state for prolonged shelf life through smoking or sun drying. The processing of fishes is ideal to coastal areas that are not equipped with refrigeration facilities or cold storage that could maintain the freshness of the daily catch. It is believed that processing can also improve the flavor of the fish. The absence of the kilns in most of the houses and the unavailability of food as fuel makes smoking less favorable among women fisherfolk. The challenges in strengthening women empowerment, hazards due to weather. Global warming re results in increased change in the weather systems in the country, producing more powerful typhoons and extreme warming of the sea waters that result to the death of the coral reefs and migration of fishes to the cooler waters. The southwest monsoon is quite shortened from eight months to at least four months. This affects fisher folks' potential income aside from the thought of their dependency for their daily food. Pollution problems. These transitions caused by urbanization contribute to the degradation of aquatic resources. Damages related to this manifest in coastal or maritime resources, dependent communities such as inexplicable fish kills, fish production problems, reduction of catch, and abnormalities found in fish species. Financial availability. Cash income from fishing activities are distributed in various expenditures such as food, children's allowances, and other miscellaneous goods that are maintained on a daily basis. Women fisher folk often sacrifice the capital intended for their fishing activities, inhibiting them to continue the fish trade and related ventures. Product preservation. Fish being highly perishable product needs to be well handled and preserved. Immediate processing is required in order to prolong the shelf life of the fishes if they are not immediately delivered to the marketplace. The inability to provide facilities such as cold storage and ice production equipment makes it more difficult for women fisher folk to compete against traders from the mainland. For conclusion, the study eliminates the notion that women are just minimally involved in the fishing industry. The study provides substantial evidentiary narrative that women have a variety of roles in the coastal environment, particularly as salt makers, salted fish makers, fish wholesalers, shrimp paste makers, fish vendors, actual fisher folks, seaweeds gatherers, oyster pickers, and aquaculture workers. This is over and beyond their primary roles as mothers, wives, and daughters to their aging parents. Despite their active participation in assuring food security for the families and the community, the women fisher folk are still denied of proper recognition in the policies drafted for the fishing communities. Those who are sincere in promoting their well-being should be serious in revising and adopting policies that can address the challenges that they have to overcome. Women were observed to be enjoying groups, but they are not encouraged nor guided to form organizations that can allow them to communicate and discuss pertinent issues and problems that could later on be beneficial for them. In building sustainable fishing communities, the fishery stakeholders should accept women fisher folks as ideal partners and collaborators in spawning initiatives for the formation of better fisheries management and development. For the recommendations, the ripple effect model, the model postulates that improved policies regarding women fisher folks can accelerate the process of social inclusion of women fisher folks in the coastal environment. A single drop of change in the lives of the women fisher folk can allow them to make a difference in the coastal communities, which can inspire others to strive and be proud of their chosen livelihood. Being empowered could motivate and facilitate others to try vigorously improving their potentials and serve as enablers to other women fisher folks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Palayo.
And now I'd like to invite the Tutu Ong for her presentation on the people of Inner Lake in Myanmar. Please welcome her. Hello. Hello, everybody. I am Tutu Ong from the Department of Archaeology and National Museum of Myanmar. Firstly, I would like to, to thank you, Ichkep, and in the square here, and then I appreciate to mention about our culture to this webinar. Today, I would like to highlight about the maritime culture of the Inly Lake. Inly Lake is a mix of biodiversity and cultural diversity. Local, uh, local community have adapted unique lifestyle and livelihood and uh, around the biosphere uh, uh, environment. It is the second large of the uh, lake of Myanmar and freshwater shallow lake, uh, located on the western edge of the uh, Shan Plateau and eastern Myanmar. Uh, it was uh, it was led uh, as ASEAN Heritage uh, Park in 2003, and in 2015, it is uh, included in the World Network of Biosphere Research of the UNESCO. Um, Inle Lake uh, is a major tourist destination and, and attracted by the picturesque beauty of Lake House 10 uh, on the pool, on the lake, beautiful, floating, uh, current, and Fisherman's style and traditional handicrafts. And because of that, I, I would like to highlight uh, among the maritime and place, uh, I'd like to mention about the Inland Lake and the people who live in Ko, uh, in Lake Ko, in the, uh, who are the main ethnic groups uh, and the Daoyo, Bao, and Ganyan, Xian people also eat its diversity. Uh, in the lift on the lake, uh, living um, by fishing, cultivations, and handicraft. Uh, for the transport, they always use uh, uh, their boat. And, and for household, uh, for, for long transportation, they use engine. And for the household, the small boat use uh, for the diet, uh, they, they are daily activities. And the unique style of the indoor is rowing in the boat with one leg by standing. And this pedal this way because they pedal this way because seeds and water plants are many in the lake, and when they roll, uh, set it down on the boat, they could not see them. And for this uh, pride is, and for this pride is, this is no gender. There is no gender. People are pride and trained and uh, since an early age. Uh, the main economics of in the lake is at the Prodi Garden. It is the unique of the in the lake. And there is a Turkian natural beauty and significance of the lake. Uh, there are seen of the inter people fishermen for six months and farmer for six months. Uh, this means in, in in year uh, in the people in the people and they they work as a fisherman for six months and they work as uh, a cultivator for six months. In the Plody Garden, the, uh, the Plody Island has two types of uh, natural islands and man made islands. The natural islands of Plody uh, began as a Plody Island, uh, islet, psycholytic, and organizing of water, hyacinths, reeds, and flocks and within the mat, and for a long time. Um, formerly, they saw the, uh, the, the far. And the natural flow of the island as saw as a farmer uh, wanted from the shore of the lake and then two wet boats sticks to the lake bank uh, by bamboo pool on which they can freely slide and then down with the water level uh, fluent and the day and the floaty currents uh, the, the natural protein um, currents are uh, products uh, prohibits um, by the government because of the sustainable environments. So they use the uh, man-made island. 
the Mimid Island um, with the grass of the garden, reef, water hyacinths, and from the old soil removed from the surface of the floating island, and played in the clean water fine system with the line up and put there for three years. And the main crops of the this is the, the floaty curry and, and locally called Yi Chan. And Yi means uh, water and Chan means the currents and the, the uh, hydroponics farming. The main crops of floating and currents are tomato and then other, uh, other crops are the cultivated. All the cultivation in the West uh, used both throughout the cultivation season. Um, the crops are sold uh, directly at Friday markets or near town markets. The second major livelihood of the inter is a fishing, the fishing skill with one lake are the symbol of the uh, in the lake. The fishermen building stamps it on one leg at one end of the boat and they can do with hand and uh, fishing freedom. Uh, uh, in the fisher, uh, fishermen use a variety of fishing methods uh, like a zip gear in the hooks and line, bamboo con, uh, conical neck and, and fish traps. And uh, the traditional style of fishing of the Inlay Lake is with a big bamboo conical neck locally called Sao, um, which is an icon of the Indian people. Uh, eventually, residents they, uh, um, of the, uh, residents, they, they, they do not, and uh, they, let's use like this kind of uh, fiction. Um, and it is for the, uh, it is for demonstrated. Um, uh, and then they intend to take a picture of the visitor only. According to the medical uh, ancestral, the whole uh, community is the sum of the uh, lake and there is no control and no restraint to use all the own resource of the lake. For, uh, for example, any fisherman can catch his lake in any village and uh, any place of the lake what they want. They don't demarcate it, the territory for fishing, uh, but now for the sustainable and uh, environments and resource are control or within community dances and sun are by government. After catered to eat the whole, most fixture fishes are sold either village via uh, by whole fishes on the boat or fighting markets or um, in the market. Actually, um, in the fishermen are also agriculturalists. They go fishing only uh, after the uh, completion of agricultural works. Traditionally, they do not use a fish uh, in the great deal of religious, Sabbath days, and the market days. Uh, as the fishing uh, and market system in the fishermen are not really commercial fishermen, but in can sufficient as only for uh, substances. For main uh, maritime skills of interleafy uh, are not only floggy gardens and fishing, but also handicrafts. It, it has various handicrafts workshops, such as um, blacksmiths, and building boat, and silver smiths, and making tobacco, and weaving. In, in the uh, silver smith is popular through the whole Xi'an state. Uh, these handicrafts are also support to the local economy. Among these handicrafts, Lotus weaving is an uh, appetite and one more symbols of the Inly Lake. Uh, in the region, uh, origin lotus textile is only for offering products and men's, but now that now that it, it is weave as a splendor products uh, and precious brand. And the whole process from picking the lotus uh, uh, plants uh, uh, to uh, extracting the fiber from the stream to weaving is all done by hand and it's environmentally friendly. Most of the lotus weaver are women and as can do household. And the weaving workshop are well established part of the tourists and, and look uh, um, visitor. Nate, the skill of the Indian is a Maggie traditional cuisine. The Indian cuisine are famous among uh, Myanmar traditional food. 
uh, as the Kachuk Pride is in the Inly Lake, uh, most of people are Buddhism and all the festival events are related to the Buddhism. Aman Festival, um, the Founder of Bagura Festival is uh, uh, famous in, uh, uh, in, in Myanmar and this is held uh, almost a month. Within the festival, uh, for Buddha image are placed or a riot badge with it, which is tall with special long boat needed by the app mm, to ha ha hundred by uh, let ruler to travel to 21 villages around the lake. Uh, in this festival, all people around the lake are organized as uh, believers. And this network has been completed by a strong social cohesion that all ethnic groups. This process is a key involving all the village, lake, Held tribe population and all the indigenous people and their relationships. And during the festival, the highlight of the festival is about raising by leg and the rules tenny and um, rulers tenny and rolly with one leg, and it includes men both race and uh, women both race. This is the highlight of the uh, festivals. And for the uh, economy, look at economy. The, uh, in the, uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the economy of the inter ethnic groups of Lowy Gardens uh, are found on the land nearby, uh, livestock, uh, breeding, and uh, fishing. The main economy of the inlay is product for tomato and community depends on agricultural uh, farming. Inlay Lake is the targets of tourists and it's support to the local. Uh, Community uh, economy uh, for the local commercial that like Jela close like with the hill tribes such as Bao, Daoyu, Danu, and other tribes and related by fighting market cycle around the lake. As a fighting market and floating ma uh, markets are the major uh, center for the East Chinese product, important uh, eating pools and uh, ethnic groups can meet straight around the lake. Uh, at the local, look at the community during the uh, uh, COVID-19. As an inland lake is a famous place uh, for tourists and local visitors, the, the local community has many chance for uh, occupation and income and uh, depends on the tourists. However, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, pandemic uh, the tourism is declined and the business that uh, relies on tourists are fair. And that crops are, and, and tomatoes are slightly at the lower price because of lockdown. It is a close uh, um, to the economy, lose to the economies when the cultivation business is not a much income uh, of the daily life. Fishing is a support for daily income. But uh, not a lot of uh, effort during the COVID-19 by fishing, but in them, um, um, due to low fish trade. And, fight, uh, and also fighting markets are, are, are prohibited because of the pandemic uh, and cannot be trade between and uh, tribes regularly. But because of the COVID-19, the Plody Garden is um, improved. Uh, as uh, ancient times, the format uh, the one before the COVID-19, the building market prided in in Inlay Lake is almost disappear. But now um, it is uh, uh, re re recovered, uh, uh, re improved, uh, and this uh, this pride is because the the fighting markets and the markets are locked down, and so they used uh, uh, the the floating markets. And then, even though facing with this uh, difficulty, the interkeeper struggle uh, for daily life by fishing and selling, and they are some product and handicrafts at Nyangshui and Tangji Market. Uh, nonetheless, the ethnic groups uh, and the indigenous people in the inlay region are uh, challenging the pediments and trying to survive by practicing uh, their tradition and custom. <laughs> For the conclusion, traditional American skills of the uh, Inlay Lake are activated not only within the community and but other indigenous people. The knowledge of the tradition is transmitted um, as an activity of the daily life. Uh, in the Inlay traditional practice, 
and their agenda identities. That is, Pesci is a work for women, and, and weaving is uh, for women. And, and the uh, religious pride is only men can throw on that pound of weight, uh, but even they have a gender perspective in the uh, basis with the balance of social and cultural activities because of diverse cultural and rich natural resources in Lily has many economic activities which are accompanied with tradition, cultural and um, and uh, inter adapted to their environment for um, their lively one trying to hand over the traditional uh, custom to the next generation. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Um, and the uh, next speaker is the next speaker is the Liu Fong Tao. Uh, her presentation is about the Whale Worship Festival in Vietnam. So please welcome her. morning Uh, today I will present my uh, presentation on the preservation maritime cultural values and promoting community cohesion from the viewpoint of the a, a festival of the queer worship in a cent northern center province of Vietnam. Uh, first, uh, I would like to introduce a brief uh, detail of the festival. Uh, the festival is uh, an important part of the human cultural and spiritual life. Uh, and in uh, in the province, the Khao Ngu is uh, the most typical and biggest yearly festival of the fishing community. It has been handed down from the generation to the generation and strongly influenced the spiritual life and beliefs of the culture inhabitant in the commune. Uh, the festival is also a historical data source, a material and spiritual evidence of the seas and island sovereignty, and the experience living with the sea of the Vietnamese generation. It also demonstrates the local community identity, and it reflects the cultural diversity and the human creativity over generations. It can be restored and voluntarily preserved by the community for a long time. Uh, <clears throat> that's why in the 2070, the festival was recognized by the Vietnamese Ministry of Cultural Sports and Tourism as a national intangible cultural heritage. Uh, in this paper, I would I not mention the, the detail of the festival, but I want to focus on the mar maritime cultural values and community cohesion uh, of the festival. 
you know, the festival is a period of sec or secular celebration that honor the community values and uh, the identify the, their identity and the continuity of the festival and the people. <clears throat> the related traditional knowledge has been passed down for generations through the cultural practice, customs, rituals, beliefs, religions, proverbs, and songs, and so on. The activities in the festival has been enriched in the cultural exchange and uh, cultural acculturation. It shows the cultural diversity imbued with the creativity of different fishermen generation. Uh, the first um, values of the, uh, the first value of the festival I want to mention is it represents the spiritual beliefs of the fishing inhabitant. The festival is a milestone marking the beginning of a production cycle or reflecting several characteristic social life of each community. Uh, in addition to the festival flats, palanquins, and procession customs, the visual arts and unique characteristics of the fishing community have been shown in the major offering object. It is a big sack votive dragon boat. <clears throat> in the festival, uh, it, it is it simulates the function and power of the sea gods. People worship their offerings and wish for a peaceful and prosperous life. It has a great significance in terms of the spiritual aspect. It expresses the uniqueness of the culture and religious, the religious life of the fishing community. On this occasion, the fishermen do not go fishing, and the local people who live in other, in other provinces return home to attend the festival. The second value is it represents the <clears throat> spiritual belief of the fishing inhabitant. People and character characteristics have been always influenced by geographic, geographic location or resident terrain. For centuries, despite of natural risks and disaster from the sea, the fishing community in Ngulok has always relied to the sea to earn their living. They have gradually they have gradually created a living and cultural space that reflect uh, through the festival, beliefs, custom, performing arts and architectures of the temples and shrine. Here you can see some image of the festival to show the people adore to the sea god. The, the festival special feature, the main, uh, the main feature is the votive dragon boat. It is the most important symbol and offering that shows the differences of a, commu a fishing community. After completing the votive boat, people choose a good time to point the eyes of boat before starting their procession rituals because the thing that the bow needs the eye to see the road on the sea, like the human and to increase the segment of the festival. After that, it, the bow, the votive bow is considered to have a soul. The most important part is the sacrifice at the main altar and at the bow worshiping place. The sacrifice to the sea gods are performed in accordance with traditional rituals. Normally, the rite related to the votive bowls is reserved for the fishermen only. And after the ceremony, the big votive bowl is burned at the beach to send people's wish to the sea gods. The third feature is the festival shows the community power and cohesion. Because the festival is connected globally to a certain community or area. It has its own regional nuance. It is closely linked to the local community to meet their spiritual and cultural needs in terms of the festival content and style. 
It is also shown in sacrifice oration, offerings, custom, palanquins, and flag sign. The Kongu World Worship Festival is respected and preserved by the community because of many positive meanings. It is an opportunity to show the community strength, the community, the community strength and the glue holding the member of the community together. The fishermen in Nulok is united due to they share a same living area, a natural resource and a marine economic benefits. The environment of the traditional festival is basically the village the, where they live. That's, that, that's why it is a favorable environment in which the traditional cultural elements are preserved and developed. Though traditional cultural elements are the quintessence drawn and the perfected in the community's development. The festival is also a period in the past after a period of interruption. Now the festival is, has been recovered and renewed by the local community through the ancient documents on the memory of the village elderly. This is not a way of honoring traditional cultural values of the community and typical cultural feature of each village, but also representing the community's solidarity and the love of their homeland and village. The fourth value is it, the festival hand over traditional maritime experience and knowledge. Uh, each, have, each festival appears, exists, and develops when it becomes a voluntary demand of a community. It is also a need to greet and enjoy the material and spiritual culture values of the local inhabitants and it form an education and transfer traditional ethical values to the next generation in a very particular way. In the past, the most votive dragon bow was small and simple then, by the time it has made bigger and more splendid. The bamboo is used to greet the frame boat and the outside of the frame is have a matte layer, then people cover them with a cardboard layer. Uh, to make the votive bowls, talented and virtuous artisans were selected in the village. They were divided into many groups and each group leader managed and arranged people to work. The cultural preservation and transmission through the generation have been promoted through the Kaungu World War VI Festival. It is a spike to preserve and transfer traditional knowledge, like making the dragon boat, the taboo related to the process of making, uh, the transfer, the song, the music, the rituals and game from generation to generation. And during that process, the old man instruct young people how to, how to make the votive boat and how, uh, which taboo they have to avoid. And this is a way of preserving the community cultures. And the, and the fifth uh, feature of the festival is it attracts crowds of tourists. Uh, it's a, a festival conceived of two parts, the ceremony and the festi festivity. The ceremony plays the most important role in the festival with prayer for the safety at sea and offering sacrifice. The, festi the festivity includes folk game and cultural activity that characterize a fishing life, such as squid fishing, drag net. And at the end of the, uh, the festival, the dragon bow is carried to the beach and burned with the meaning of sending the fisherman wishes to the sea. Previously, the festival was only for fishermen, but now it is a festival for people of different occupations and localities who are interested in the fishery and national legacy. Uh, in this year, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the festival was held in a very small scale. Uh, 
for the conclusion, I want to, to, to say that the Khao Ngư festival is not merely a festival, but it is a window to look into the society and its structure. It features as the segment, the complexity and the community spirit. The festival is filled with various traditional conception and knowledge to create a cohesion among the community members. And um, the festival scale is affected by the pandemic or the natural disaster. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you, Li. And the uh, last speaker is Dr. Baspai from India. She will talk about the fishermen across the Bay of Bengal region. Hello, everybody. Uh, um, just a second. I'll... Right. Um, good morning, everybody. And I guess it's good afternoon also uh, at places. Uh, my various colleagues have joined in today's uh, seminar. Uh, today, uh, I would be talking about an aspect which I have been working on for the last couple of years uh, across the Bay of Bengal, including the three uh, specific countries of Bangladesh, India, and uh, Sri Lanka. The title of my presentation is uh, The Fisherwoman Across this Bay of Bengal region, especially bordering the Western fringes, the Northern and the Western fringes of the Bay of Bengal, comprising the countries of Bangladesh, uh, India, and Sri Lanka, and the extension of their profession towards understanding the contribution of the woman as a vital part of community their symbolisms of sustainability, survival, and continuity. The format of uh, my presentation uh, would follow. I would like to introduce the region first and uh, thereby move on to speak about the fishermen, women of India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. Then I would like to move on and highlight a few aspects of the alternative methods of income through arts, crafts, livestock, and others in India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. And then I would like to conclude my topic. So to move on talking about uh, this area of Bay of Bengal, it's important to understand uh, the region of study, the, the geographic uh, location of study. This region, this huge uh, water body, is an embayment of the northeastern Indian Ocean and occupies an area of around 839,000 square miles. It is around 1,000 miles wide and has an average depth of more than 8,500 feet. India, in this huge section alone, has around more than 9 million active line in between around the 80% are small scale fishers. A sector of fisheries in India alone employs 15 million people and contributes towards 1.1% of the GDP of India. Now in the middle of the entire fisher folk contributing not only from India, but also including the regions of Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, stands the woman community, the woman people of the same community, within the same community. They have been contributing through generations and uh, is also supplementing the family income through alternative methods of income, as well as maintain themselves as the main channels of various elements of intangible cultural heritage, including 
traditional methods of fishing. This particular study wants to highlight some of their aspects pertaining to their contribution towards the main profession, which is fishing, as well as how much they also help to contribute towards these alternative methods of income to sustain the family on one hand. And on the other hand, the larger picture says that it also helps to maintain certain aspects of intangible cultural heritage within the community. Now, historically- Excuse me, Dr. Rupa Mudra. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, your volume is very low and please speak up and uh, your mic is- Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Am I clear? Uh, people, <laughs> yes. Am I clear now? More louder. Am I clear now, sir? Yes, yes. Okay. So historically speaking, this area has occupied a very significant uh, region, a very important section as far as trade and commerce goes. Archaeologically, this uh, trade and commerce can be traced as far back as uh, 4th century BCE. And interestingly enough, marine product as part of a regular diet has also been seen to go far as back as the Holocene period around 6200 BC as uh, seen from archaeological evidences from Sri Lanka. Being a busy region, whether I'm talking about maritime activities in trade and commerce or for that matter, fishing as an occupation, the region continues to be a very important section in the present time. A busy area, there have been various agreements drafted between countries which looks after the trade and commerce as well as occupation in this region. So to say, say for example, BIMSTEC, Bay of Bengal Initiative, for multi-sectoral, technical, and economic cooperation with the member states of Bangladesh, India, Bhutan, Myanmar, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. There are 14 priority sectors over here of cooperation, of which the sixth sector looks into fisheries. There is also a very important aspect of the exclusive economic zone, EEZ, which has divided the water body between Bangladesh, India, and Myanmar. However, what is important to highlight here is in spite of all of these agreements, the situation doesn't seem to be very calm in the region. Often foreign boats are arrested, fishermen get arrested in the process. There are clashes between fishermen from different countries who are often caught fishing in an EEZ of another country's water and thereby these regular uncertainty adds to the woes of the fisher folk. Adding to this are natural calamities like the present uh, situation of the COVID-19 pandemic, almost bringing the entire profession of the region to a sudden halt. In spite of this, the work of the fisherwoman is very, very important, but very limited in the region. These are often considered as marginal activities, hardly given the same significance which is generally given to the fishermen who go out into the main waters of the Bay of Bengal in large boats and trawlers for fishing. And the main activities of the fisherwoman are generally limited to aspects like selling fishes, catching various aquatic products like seaweed, crabs, prawns, through traditional, often through traditional methods or helping in the making of handicrafts to add to the family income. Across the last several years, there have been many organizations, uh, NGOs per to say, national as well as international, as well as initiatives on part of the uh, different governments, which has contributed and encouraged the participation of the women in the region. This is something I wanted to share, particularly because the general reflection of women in the Bay of Bengal, fisherwomen, is very limited in nature. 
this particular calendar dating from the 1998 the details of the calendar are given on the right hand side uh drawings by e m alore practically highlights the fisher woman of the bay of bengal region and i have tried to incorporate one picture pertaining to each of the countries that i would be speaking about today about india there are different states which borders the bay of bengal including west bengal orissa telangana andhra pradesh tamil nadu and the union territory of the andaman and the nicobar islands work limited in nature for the fisher women can only be seen in areas of catching small fry crabs and prawns and shrimp or capturing and mollusks or shells or maybe hand braiding of fishing nets sometimes the fisher women are helped by the fisheries department of india or the work of several ngos who are working in this area the states particularly they often help these fisher women to economically stabilize their family income by extending self help groups social groups also and there have been many success stories over the years as a result of this uh, very planned economic development i would like to highlight here a very interesting fact which comes from the state of orissa which is uh, bordering the northern part of the bay of bengal from india that a self help group constituted by the women has even led to the formation of a group called as samudram which also helps in the conservation and preservation of the endangered olive ridley turtle in the region as a result of this conservation effort fishing is banned in the region between november 1st to may 31st i would also like to mention the contributions of the fisher women belonging to different ethnic tribes from the andaman and the nicobar islands of india interesting to see in the islands they fish alongside the men there are generally no distinction available or seen they can be seen to fish in the shallow reefs as well as the rocky areas as well as during the night time more importantly the methods used by these women just like the men of the region are often the traditional methods i would be showing some examples in one of my later slides also very interesting to understand is the traditional knowledge consisting both the men and the women of the region which helps them in fishing also warranting them beforehand about natural calamities like cyclones rain wind waves water currents or anything related to similar such natural calamities with the water moving on to looking at bangladesh this is another picture from the same 98 calendar the role of women just like india is often relegated to the background it is estimated that around 30% of the women in the rural coastal areas are directly or indirectly engaged in small scale fishery activities the regions often include areas of borishal and rajshahi district where women are often involved in areas of uh, fish capture selling drying and curing of both fresh water and sea products or the chittagong and the khulna district where women are generally seen to be involved in shrimp processing plants a very important uh, part of a congress being held particularly only including the fisher women organizing their family income sustainability and helped them further to organize themselves as a community at the whole the women contributing towards fish processing and preserving is a very vital aspect which also uh, uh, extends its uh, helping hand to uh, export sector of the country and also the saving groups which i just spoke about moving on to the last section of my region of study in sri lanka the story of sri lanka constitutes the region of the northern and the eastern fringes of sri lanka which borders the bay of bengal however 
the documentation from sri lanka is very limited in nature for the unfortunate war the political conflict which the country faced for three decades the war affected the entire country nonetheless but the regions of the northern and the eastern sections which i would be uh, looking into were highly and greatly affected so much so that areas uh, were highly crippled through loss of equipments lives and infrastructure and thus very heavy restrictions the fishery sector which was greatly affected in the region was one of the major sectors which the government also took into discussion once the war ended in 2009 because of all of these problems the documentation during these three decades is very limited in nature from the region of study however i would like to highlight here that these are very vital elements to look into particularly to understand the non traditional roles of women as well as the traditional maritime practices to support community in times of disaster like the political conflict which was going on over there the post war data is very limited from very small sections here i would like to mention about a region of trimkumali from the eastern coast of the country bordering the bay of bengal the fisher women in the region is highly divided as far as ethnicity and religion goes there are women comprising of sinhalese buddhist community sri lankan tamil hindu community or the sri lankan moor community the muslims and there are other ethnic communities the vedar women the sinhalese and the tamil women are generally involved in selling fishes while the muslim women are seen to be involved in gleaning of clams and mollusks from the mud or collecting seaweeds very interestingly enough over here is the contribution of the vedar ethnic community women of the region who are seen to take part in the fishing activities just alongside the men to draw up the catch on shore in sri lanka the other activities of women pertaining to fishery sector is severely restricted in comparison to the other countries of the region now historically speaking fishing as an occupation was highly restricted to the main folk of the region mostly dominated by the men in the post war period some sections has opened up for the women say for example the pictures that shows over here seaweed collecting or fish drying also very limited and highly divided in nature between the religious and the ethnic sections of the community finally thus if these are the women folk of the community it brings us to look into a very high important sector of how these women folk contribute to the family income through other alternative methods these while introducing india this is a interesting example from the region of west bengal referred to as machher ba from the local language which speaks about a scroll painting done by women and speaks about a song which is uh, mentioned on the right hand side on the left hand side explains the essence explains that a group of fish attending a friend's marriage a huge fish not being invited causes disruption by gobbling up the remaining fish thereby creating a complete pandemonium a uh, art a very vital a very interesting art which is famous as a scroll painting from the region not only across india but in different parts of the world and often is uh, narrated in a format of music it is a uh, narration is done through a singing pattern as the painter unrolls the scroll and this particularly is a very important uh, painting in relation to the women folk other aspects from the same region of west bengal includes very fantastic uh, creations of art using fish scales example shown over here includes necklaces earrings decorative items 
Moving on to more interesting aspects, one of my very favorite ones that looks into a sequence from the Indian uh, famous epic, the Mahabharata, which looks into the narration of Krishna, Lord Krishna to Arjuna in the battle of the Kurukshetra, which the sequence is compiled into religious text of the Gita. A very interesting and another favorite of mine is this creation of the meditating Buddha from different phases of the Buddha's life, also including the same creation by fish scales. From other states of India, the contribution of women includes uh, mollusks and shell work from the states of Orissa, Telangana, Tamil Nadu, and a very interesting example I wanted to cite over here, ranging from the time period of the 2004 December tsunami, the contribution of women, the fisherwoman, making rag dolls to supplement family income, tsunamika. This became very famous and helped a lot in sustaining the immediate disaster that most of the fisher folk, the communities faced as a result of the tsunami. Here I would like to highlight from the Andaman and the Nicobar Islands, certain aspects of the traditional methods of fishing, which is used, as I mentioned earlier, by both the men and the women. Something to note over here is the massive use of plastic. Unfortunate, nevertheless, they often use this plastic waste to add to these traditional methods of fishing as a bait use. Looking at the neighboring region of Bangladesh, the income, the supplementary income of women folk includes net making, cage culture, fish farming, poultry rearing, ducks and chicken, small dairy products like goats and cows, handicraft items like making uh, or sewing or embroidery, or even starting new business ventures like small grocery shops, tea stalls, as well as plant nurseries. These are variously encouraged by NGOs, as well as the governmental bodies. Finally, looking into Sri Lanka, as mentioned earlier, the role of fisher women being very limited in nature, they are often encouraged by NGOs, as well as the governmental bodies to look into alternative methods of income. And they are practically the primary people who look into this as well as supplement their households. Here, I would like to highlight the kind of uh, handicraft they make, products of wood, mollusks, as well as coconut elki, as well as animal husbandry, sawing clothes, ecotourism, and also aloe vera farming for use in medicine and cosmetic. These are often seen to be in the parts of the lagoons on the eastern as well as the northern parts of Sri Lanka. Finally, I come to look at what has really happened across the last months in the region. It is interesting to see some part is seen to be uh, some uh, newspapers often speak about the plight of the fishermen of the region. However, very little is spoken about when it comes to the plight of the fisherwoman. How are they doing? How are they supplementing the family income? My extensive research across the last several months could only yield one single report, which comes from the, not the area of my study, but from the Western coastline of India on the Northern, towards the Northern tip from the region of Kerala. But however, I wanted to put this up from the uh, leading Indian English daily, the Indian Express dated 10th of July. And this is something that I found to reflect the plight and the woe of the fisherwomen of the entire region. Many of their husbands have lost the job and the woman stands as the major role in the financial stability of the family. Many men have taken up the places of these women in the markets, resulting in many of these women also losing the job as uh, uh, the customers often move on to the men who are new to selling fishes. Finally, I would like to come to the uh, end highlighting 
that the contribution of the woman is generally never recognized as far as whatever they are doing, supplementing the family income in the main profession or even in alternative professions. But say, for example, shrimp or prawn cultivation or farming in the region, woman contributes majorly. And something to note over here, prawns and fishing contributes to a major foreign exchange earnings of the region. So one can really understand how much activity and contribution of the woman folk goes into sustaining this foreign exchange. Nevertheless, their uh, recognition remains marginalized. Their voices remains marginalized, hardly spoken about. As I just mentioned that even newspaper reports speaking about their condition during the last several months of lockdown, both complete and partial lockdown is very, very limited in nature. Something that I would like to end by saying that since they do contribute towards such very uh, important sectors, acting also at times as the true torch bearers of social cohesion and intangible cultural heritage, it is very important to spread the knowledge and highlight their contributions in, as part of the entire community. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rupamudra. Thank you, sir. And the, even though the scheduled time is over, that let's make a panel discussion for a while. And among five presentations, two presentations from Thailand and the Vietnam uh, directly relate to the maritime ICH, while two other presentations from the Bengal region and the Philippines uh, related to uh, talk about the women's visibility in the fishery industry and also in the fishing community. And uh, the last one from the uh, Inlay in Illa uh, Lake uh, shows the harmonious relations between the biosphere reserves and the ice age. So my question uh, goes to Thailand case. And in the Thailand, the, your uh, your presentation uh, shows that the practice of sharing food in Chaole community and exchange food between communities gave us helpful insights on the COVID-19 pandemic. So my question is uh, directly related to uh, ICH. Nowadays, spoken people produce not the real world by the model board, how was the Mokhen Kebang designated as national ICH in Thailand? Thank you very much for the question. And uh, although Thailand is quite late in ratifying UNESCO ICH convention, uh, Thailand ratified in 2016, but since 2009, the Department of Cultural Promotion, Ministry of Culture, uh, has uh, received um, application uh, or nomination of ICH. So every year, there's a call for nomination, and communities or um, cultural council uh, could also uh, propose uh, whatever oral traditions or traditional crafts in the community. And there will be a selection by committee a committee of experts every year. So uh, my team member, since we work um, with the uh, Morgan community, we made the draft and then the local cu culture council uh, took the draft and then we adapted uh, to, uh, to submit uh, for the nomination. So there's a long process. There are a lot of forms, but then um, I'd like to point out that we need some some people who have information and appreciation to start the procedure 
um, because uh, I think similar to our colleagues who talk about uh, gender and development, especially um, Fisher folks and Fisher uh, women, um, they are mostly invisible. So similar to the situation with the sea nomad or Chaole in Thailand, they're practically invisible and their um, practices and knowledge um, have been neglected. So I think this is the first step for recognition of the um, ICH, but then we should do more because um, with the process modernization and then really huge um, uh, rapid uh, economic growth, there is need for protection and promotion as well. So, uh, so I think ICH and then the, the nomination, the signifying the uh, national uh, ICH is, is important and it's uh, quite successful, but we need to do more than that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, next uh, question goes to the Kanu Festival. And according to your presentation, the festival is filled with various traditional concepts and knowledge. But uh, your presentation does not deal with uh, uh, directly what kinds of uh, traditional uh, conception and knowledge are related to the Kanu Festival. Morning. Uh, I would like to uh, explain more about the, the the concept and the traditional concept and the knowledge related to the festival. Uh, firstly, it's, uh, it it uh, includes the community belief about the the world the the world, world worship because uh, the fishermen they live. Uh, mainly on the sea, so they have to perform a ritual uh, to to show the respect to the world and to the sea gods. And in the past, it is a uh, uh, merely a ritual, but now it's uh, it's uh, it's quite big, like a, a national festival, ICH festival, and um. <clears throat> Because the fishermen say uh, the same concept that the world is a sad creature in the sea, and, uh, and uh, they have uh, to a savior to fishermen and sea pharaohs. That's why they have to to show their respect in the festival. And um, <clears throat> uh, the, the second uh, knowledge is uh, the uh, the young people have transfer the knowledge of how to make a main uh, big votive both for the festival uh, it is very special in the in this area because in other area of the fishing community they don't have they have the festival but don't have the the big votive uh, boat uh, and that was uh, through the festival the the knowledge of how to make the boat and the taboo they have to follow uh, during the process of making the boat, uh, the old the old old men have to 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 transfer and to hand hand down to the the the, the young man in the village, uh, <clears throat> and then in the process of the making the boat, they have to to uh, to guide the young people how with the handicraft of making the, how to make the frame, the bamboo, the paper, uh, the pongy statues on the boat, uh, many related um, uh, knowledge uh, of the, the, the um, offering making. And uh, I think one important conception that the, the young people can have a, uh, an idea of the sovereignty of the um, sea and islands because the, fest the festival is a ten intangible cultural heritage, but it associated with the people, the resident and uh, the practice. That's why um, I choose the topic. Maybe the pre uh, my presentation is not um, clear enough, but in the paper, in the full paper, I, I, I show on it. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And the uh, next 
uh, topic is about the women's empowerment. So uh, this general and question goes to Filipino case and the Bengal cases. And how does the visibility of women contribute to women's empowerment? So anyone? That I would like to answer. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, question and I would uh, like to add, uh, am I audible uh, now, sir? No, oh, yeah, it's clear. Yeah, this uh, time I'm audible. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, this is something practically which I wanted to highlight uh, through my paper, the whole idea of uh, uh, putting up this research paper. Thank you for that. And I would like to answer two important uh, sections for this. One is that uh, whenever I speak about uh, uh, social groups being formed by these women, now this is a very important step uh, in their life. Uh, generally, the income now uh, which is uh, generated by the men folk, which also is limited in nature because there are lean seasons of fishing. Uh, also, there are seasons when it is uh, uh, the nationally, it is not permitted to fish in certain uh, the waters. So the women take charge in those times uh, with uh, their alternative methods of uh, uh, organized uh, methods of uh, handicrafts and uh, the examples which I showed right now. Also, something to note over here is a lot of money is wasted by the men folk as a result of uh, heavy drinking uh, liquor. This is something, uh, uh, the example of the olive ridley turtle conservation effort, which I just mentioned during my presentation, a woman, first step that they did, Oh, I think that uh, they have connection to the Wi-Fi or something is not long. So how about uh, Professor Pelayo? Yes, um, yeah. I would like to add something about what you're saying. Well, um, actually the exclusion and unrecognizability of women in the fishing community really contributes to their increased vulnerability and uh, also disempowerment. So it is believed that if women will be continuously acknowledged, be acknowledged and be visible in the fishing communities, they will maintain a feeling of self-worth that will be matched with their ability to make personal choices. And if their rights will be upheld, it will inspire them to strive harder and continue to be proud of their chosen livelihood. And they will be fully, they will be fully empowered and to, um, mention also, there are some studies that says that the fishing sector can only attain development in full capacity if women that are involved in the fisheries will gain also undistinguishable and equal chances with men in order for them to keep that so-called empowerment within them. Thank you. Okay. And the last three, I want have a lesson from the Inle Lake about the uh, relations, good relationship between the Biosphere Reserve and the uh, Ice Age. So please. Uh, I cannot hear you, so please turn on the audio. I cannot hear you. No, you're... Uh... Hello. Okay. You uh, yes, yeah. 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 Thank you for your question. Mm. And the biospheres and uh, the rel rela uh, relationship between biospheres and ICH in Lee Lake, um, mm. because uh, in Lee Lake is a general lake located uh, and about 80, uh, 884 meters above the sea levels. And then it is uh, 
a total stream is 29 stream in the water fresh followed into the lake and then it is uh, a lot it has a lot of uh, uh, species uh, like uh, uh, fish uh, and and then birds and uh, other species like a snake and uh, for example uh, uh, there are 927 species of the medical medicinal plants and 11 species of bamboo and then um, uh, 184 species uh, of the orchids and the other species of the plants. Uh, and then fauna species are diverse and the lake uh, is a, a nesting place of the glue where uh, in that age, uh, uh, and the uh, fish, fish uh, species are I think 44 uh, species of the fish uh, and 267 but uh, of the species. We, this is, species are, are, uh, are the the uh, numera uh, from the numera it's uh, inly inly has a, like a, the, a lot of species and in that people and then uh, ne uh, near the town here like a uh, inly lake uh, there has 20 36 village uh, and and conspiring uh, 40, 444 village, including town of the Nyangshui, uh, approximately. And that the dominant ethnic group settled in the lake regions. Uh, and uh, and uh, I, as I mentioned, all the, in the, all the, the main ethnic group is in the. So the inter, the inter people and the, the around Inle Lake uh, diverse, uh, the ethnic groups are uh, in balance and uh, inhabited uh, with this species. For example, um, I, I, as I mentioned, the uh, in the crabs, they call in the crabs, the fish and uh, the, the kind of fish is the famous of the uh, in the lake. Uh, it is the, the uh, a species uh, fish uh, of the in the lake. Uh, they catch uh, this fish and then the um, this is uh, the costume means of the, uh, the Inta people. And so Inta people and the balance with the environment, the environment and the species, because uh, it is the relationship between um, biosphere reserves and uh, social uh, uh, ICH of the Inlay Lake. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, Dr. Lopamudra is back. So, would you finish your words? Uh, yep, uh, thank you, sir, for that. And um, very sorry, got disconnected because of internet uh, fluctuations uh, on my side. So, uh, like I was saying, that uh, uh, something very important to note is that is the fisher, the woman who not only goes to the towns to sell the fish, but also the interior markets into the rural areas of the entire region that I was talking about. The men don't. So, the selling of the fish without any middleman politics also depends upon the woman itself. The earnings trade goes to the family, the respective families. Finally, I would like to add as a concluding thing that uh, more than uh, speaking about them, I think it is the uh, awareness uh, about their visibility in the fishing sector, which should be made prominent. And I think this can be made, like I mentioned, even newspapers hardly report about the contribution of fisherwomen, including during this pandemic, the, uh, the lockdown period. Change can come, but the visibility should come also through the spread of awareness and a knowledge about these fisherwomen. I think that uh, this is something that can really contribute towards women empowerment, the fisherwomen themselves. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, one question from the YouTube, from the audience, goes to Dr. Lopamudra. So, uh, the, you mentioned the women of West Bengal and Bangladeshi, <coughs> whom are related with maritime tradition. Can you please mention that from which community they are belongs? 
Uh, this is something which I thought of highlighting uh, firstly uh, when I uh, wanted to write uh, this uh, paper. And uh, very, uh, in a small manner, I spoke about it uh, while speaking about Sri Lanka. But uh, the community, the caste sections, I want to keep it. Uh, Section uh, through an economic representation rather than through a section of uh, caste and creed. Uh, even when I was talking about Sri Lanka, which is uh, very highly divided, that's the reason I purposely kept it aside because in this uh, attempt, I wanted to look at the economic contribution of women as Hi. a community <laughs> rather than a segregated example between caste and creed of the region. So yes, I can uh, speak about it, but probably it will take another lengthy discussion, uh, maybe in another place. Right now, I was trying to look at women without any distinction of a caste as an economic section and their contribution in the region. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, a question about the uh, Konyu festival and uh, in your studies of different cases you studied, what did you observe in regards to the impact of COVID and restrictions? And uh, very, uh, the question is how it affected the Canoe Festival and if it a developed a strategy as a response to the uh, COVID pandemic? Uh, uh, the, 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 the disaster and the pandemic affected the, the festival because uh, this year it would be a big uh, festival uh, because it's the, the even year. Uh, but because uh, the pandemic, people cannot uh, uh, concentrate together uh, because um, <clears throat> so, so distance, distancing. That's why the festival is just uh, organized in a very small scale, um, a, a ritual of the community, not include the, the festivity uh, activity like games or uh, sport competition uh, like other year. Is that the, the is that the, the, the content of the questions? Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. And probably the last question from the YouTube goes to Inle Lake case. Uh, you have mentioned the cultural and the social diversity in in the lake which is close associated with ICH. And your example of hydroponic farming showed how communities around the inner lake are using nature to bring economic benefits. With that being said, uh, I'm curious about what kind of efforts are taking place to save inner lake from shrinking. Many scholarly articles and the scientific studies indicate that rapid flow of deforestation and the climate change are tremendously reshaping the environment of Inland Lake. How can communities and local governments prepare for sustainable development while promoting and safeguarding the ice age? That's a big question. Eh? This is interesting questions. Uh, for uh, as you mentioned, uh, now Inlay Lake is uh, like a, um, emergency case uh, for the deforestations and other uh, pollution. And uh, at the time of for um, from May to March. Uh, May to 
uh, April, May, there is no water in the lake now. And then uh, because of uh, deforestation and other effect. So government uh, will take with uh, other INGOs uh, and to to reset the in the lake uh, and then uh, especially floating garden especially floating garden uh, I, uh, I as I mentioned in my presentation uh, former time the the farmers purchase iron floating island from the shore and lake shore and then now they are prohibited because of the environment issue and then they made uh, um, hand, uh, man made <coughs> garden only, and the government don't, um, they don't allow um, to produce the, uh, the natural island, floating, floating island. This is the first issue. And then the second is uh, the, for the ice age. For the ice age, they, now they depend on the handicrafts. Uh, and not only the floating garden, handicraft and the government. Uh, Especially Shan government, the, the, the regional government, they support to do the handicraft and and especially in the uh, Ludex weaving is the uh, the famous uh, and now it's a uh, like a trading uh, protocol of the Inly Lake and and the other um, uh, uh, intensive cultural heritage like a festival uh, like uh, other activities. Uh, uh, concern and it's a uh, uh, cooperate with the communities and the government uh, for reasonable and the founder of festival is uh, the it has a lot of uh, ICH of the inly lady it, it is the and uh, the unique of the uh, inly communities but uh, now uh, actually, this time is the festival time, but for the, because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, we don't um, uh, held to the held the, the festivals and the interviewer only uh, they celebrate the festival only their village, uh, like uh, not not like uh, normally, and but they they um, held themselves. Uh, just uh, uh, within the village only, and so um, as you mentioned, and for the the sustainable development of the uh, inly ICH is um, government uh, uh, is a uh, certificate uh, uh, like a uh, certificate and promote uh, support and. Uh, uh, knowledge uh, to the community. Thank you so much. Thank you. I see, I guess uh, there are some more questions or comments from the panel, but the time is the 30 minutes after the scheduled time. So I want close this se today's session. I you agree? <laughs> so, Minji, yeah, your turn. Thank you, Professor Yu. Uh, all the presenters, audience, I appreciate everyone for joining this webinar series today. Uh, tomorrow, at the same time, we will have session two of the webinar series. The second session will be held on the theme of traditional maritime skills and knowledge for environmental sustainability and resilience. Please check HCAP's website for further information. Thanks again for joining us today, and I hope to see you all tomorrow. Have a great day. Thank you, Manji, and thank you, Dr. Yo. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you so bye. much. Thank sure. you, everyone. Bye -bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
a great day. 네. 한 체크해보라고 유튜브로 나가서 <목소리도>